The immersive ugliness of our everyday environments in America is uh, entropy made visible. And we can't overestimate the amount of despair that we are generating with places like this. And uh, mostly I want to persuade you that we have to do better if we're going to continue the project of civilization in America. By the way, this doesn't help. <laughs> Most of us grew up hearing about the American dream. From a young age, many of us are introduced to the American dream. Preserving the American dream. We call it the American dream. I believe there is such a thing as the American dream. Achieving the American dream. Who, who, who believe in the American dream. Fair chance at that great American dream. Everyone can pursue the American dream. Working families of this country who believe in the American dream. Talking about the idea of the American dream, as the 2016 campaign cycle gets underway, most candidates are already working that term into their campaign pitches and stump speeches. And the opportunity to achieve the American dream. My parents achieved what it came to be known as the American dream. The American dream. In search of the American dream. The American dream. That's the American dream. It was repeated so often ad nauseum by politicians that I'm gonna go ahead and say it long ago lost any meaning, like that thing where you repeat a word over and over until the syllables just disintegrate in your mouth and the whole word just falls apart. If indeed it ever had any meaning to begin with, it's kind of like one of those things they just say because they hope that it triggers something in your brain anymore and, and causes an emotional reaction that's not even really connected to anything tangible. We are losing the opportunity to live the American dream. It is the dream that if you work hard, if you take responsibility for your life, if you reach for the opportunity that your human potential makes possible, you will be free to succeed. I'm, I'm going to try to resist the urge in this video to regale you with all the statistics of what's going on here economically. I think we're all Across the world, we're all feeling what's going on economically. Maybe a few. I might throw in a few. But I mean, I think a lot of us have become pretty familiar with the level things are at when you just have a plethora of videos of people crying in grocery store parking lots now because they don't know how they're going to continue to afford to feed their families. I walked out and sat in my truck and just cried. How is anyone affording to eat right now? The cost of living is quadrupled. Um, just to get groceries has now costed me a second mortgage. Let's be serious. I think they're messing with us at this point. $14 for aluminum foil and $14 for generic trash bag. I just went grocery shopping for very basic things. This amounted to $100. This isn't even barely anything to feed me for a couple days. Literally just some chicken, eggs, rice. We have elderly who, in order to put food on the table, are having to go work at Walmart even though they're 80 years old. Retirement is quite literally going to be surviving for Gen Zs, Millennials, maybe some Gen Xs. I work full-time hours and I can't afford insurance because if I opted for insurance for me and my dependents, guess what? I would work full-time just to make sure I have insurance. I wouldn't even be getting paid. I would owe them money. We can't afford to live. <laughs> Or die, because then you gotta pay for that shit too. But who said this was the dream? Because this is a nightmare. We're breaking all kinds of records for things like bankruptcies and credit card debt, and no one has any savings anymore. Back in my day, a Coke used to cost a nickel. Well, guess what? Back in my day, AKA like three years ago, a McDonald's Diet Coke was $1. And now some places it's like $3.25. Groceries are through the roof. Everything's so much more expensive. I can say back in my day, about three years ago. It's insane. We're living through like the most fast paced generation of all time. We're like, we basically lived three lives worth of living in the last 20 years. All right, here's two stats. Uh, did you know that the value of the residential real estate broke a new record? It is 52 trillion now, which is 49% higher 
than before the pandemic. So some people out there are making bank. Some people out there are not worried at all about where their next meal is going to come from. Meanwhile, the annual Getting Paid in America survey just found out that 80%, nearly 80% of Americans say they're living paycheck to paycheck now. So they asked more than 38,600 people. That's a pretty big survey size. 78% of those people said they would struggle to meet their financial obligations if their paychecks were delayed for a week. So much for that American dream. Your ability to define space and to create places that are worth caring about uh, it all comes from a body of culture that we call the, the culture of civic design. This is a body of knowledge, method, skill, and principle that we threw in the garbage after World War II and decided we don't need that anymore, we're not going to use it. And consequently, uh, we can see the result all around us. But I noticed something else during the pandemic is that they really started pushing tiny homes a lot. And it feels like the solution to the problem that was always waiting there, that they just couldn't wait to roll that one out from the shadows. <laughs> you have all these articles about how this is the adorable, it's so adorable, it's the adorable, sustainable, affordable solution to the housing crisis is just to jam everybody into a tiny freaking box. This is despite the fact, by the way, that they know that people's mental health suffers when they're jammed into these tiny, small spaces. I mean, look at this article here. It even says, research shows we can trick our brains into liking micro apartments and other small arrangements. I mean, I may not be an expert here, but if you have to trick your brain into liking something, it's because your brain did not inherently like it to begin with. Your brain knew something was wrong to begin with, and you're, you're having to force yourself into accepting it. That's not usually a good thing, right? So you have this one last facade of the house, the front, which is really a, a cartoon of a facade of a house. Because uh, notice the porch here. Unless the people who live here are munchkins, <laughs> uh, nobody's going to be using that. This is really, in fact, a television broadcasting a show 24-7 called We're Normal. We're normal, we're normal, we're normal, we're normal, we're normal. Please respect us, we're normal, we're normal, we're normal. And all of these articles that show the tiny house too, they always show it like this, where it's just this singular, trendy looking box in the middle of an open field with the beautiful sunset vistas, or, you know, this one where it's in the middle of a field with a, a lake and a mountain behind it. And that's not, that's really not what's actually happening here. That is, that is one look that they have plastered onto the thing, but that is not what they're actually selling. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. Because these places, these habitats are inducing immense amounts of anxiety and depression in children. There are even scientific studies that show that the well-being of children, for example, suffers when they're forced to live in crowded conditions. And there's this one about psychological distress and physiological distress in children who live in crowded homes. There are multiple studies on this. This is not news. This is not new. And you guys remember what happened during the pandemic, right? When people were forced to stay home in their regular sized houses. Everything got worse. Mental health issues like depression and anxiety rose. Also violent crime and abuse went up. And that's before you, you shove people into smaller and smaller and smaller spaces. But shoving people into smaller and smaller and smaller spaces is exactly what they're trying to do. It's like as far as the eye can see. Assert your creativity and individuality by choosing one of 10 exciting shades of beige. See the horizon? It's just all rooftops smashed together. Yeah. I mean, we've seen it for a while now, these cookie cutter neighborhoods everywhere, where if you didn't have GPS, you'd probably get lost, right? And they always have names like Mountain Vista or River View or something, but there's usually no mountains and no river. There's no lake in there, just so you know, not at all. 
God, I'm what? starting to get that disease where all you can see is sepia. It's so damn important for everybody to have the same color mailbox. As far as I'm concerned, this community is the American dream. <laughs> This is a new housing development 20 minutes outside of downtown San Antonio. Well, that's that's 20 minutes if there's not traffic. And for the low, low price of just $130,000 to $163,000, you too can own your own 350 square foot tiny box. That's all crammed together in there with so many other 350 square foot tiny boxes. You asked for it, and here it is. The most affordable home in San Antonio, Texas. Let's check it out. Wow, this is pretty striking for me. Housing of the future. Right we'll get whatever you got from that. What side. the hell, man? Oh, my God. I feel like I could film so many horror films in this neighborhood. What? Arrived. You've arrived. Remember all that talk about the terribleness of suburban sprawl? Well, apparently the new answer to that is just to make it more densely compacted and clustered urban sprawl. Homes where you probably feel like you can't even stretch your arms out without touching the walls. It'd be, it'd be different if they weren't charging an amount that like just three years ago, you could have bought a 1700 square foot full-size three bedroom house with a garage and a front and backyard. But this right here just feels like they're capitalizing on the fact that people have been priced completely out of home ownership by charging what is really an insane amount of money for a closet. It's like bringing everybody down to a point where they will finally accept this, but then still charging insane prices for it. When we pulled up on the road and I saw it, I just, my breath, it kind of took my breath away. Wow. Your destination. Look at that. It does look like shipping containers, actually. Holy sh It's just, it's so... There's something that is so uncanny valley about this place. And driving up and down the street felt like driving through the set of the movie Vivarium, which features a plot where a couple gets lost in one of these cookie cutter neighborhoods. And it's a pretty horrifying nightmare scenario. Wait, no, no, I don't think this is the right way. Yeah, this is the way we came in. You know, the way, I don't want to give too much on that movie away, but it's not like you're going to want to go watch that movie. That movie is, I mean, that's a tough movie. That's like, oh, wow, I'm already really depressed. I, why don't I just feel straight up suicidal and go check out Vivarium this afternoon? You know, it's just not really, it's not really a thing that most people are going to want to do. But the plot is very much like some people are just digging their whole life into a hole that never ends and some people are just running around in circles and it's very it feels that way to watch it and I mean but at least in that movie the houses were house sized and not coffin sized this is my shoebox apartment take a look So your front door opens right into the stove. Like you better be careful. And then this is the room. The front door that leads to the entire place. And you can try to force your way past the bicycle to go to the very tiny kitchen where you can make very tiny meals. And then you have this metal I guess ladder so you can climb up into your hole. And this, <laughs> this door here, I think goes to what's supposed to be your bedroom, but as you can see, the house ends right there. So that's gonna be a really tiny bedroom. Over here, there's some entertainment. You have a lovely view of the television and the balcony's the size of my thumb. You can add a couple chairs to have up to two friends over on your balcony or just bikes. Wow. Get a shot of this grass channel. You do get a strip of grass though. Like one strip. You can dress up your small balcony with a few personal touches to really make it feel like home. I wonder what the rate of divorce is for couples living in one of these. I mean, 
you can barely even see the house behind this sign. It's back there. There's a house behind that sign. This is the future of housing affordability right here. And here on the fold down bed, you can cry yourself to sleep. And it really just feels like they're just, again, dragging everybody down to a point where they're desperate enough to accept so much less. Oh, yes, it's up here. <laughs> is that where you have your friends sleep? Yeah, uh, where your children are until age. So you have this gigantor kitchen, which I guess doubles as your dining room table area. So it's a full size, pretty, I mean, it's a decent sized kitchen. And then everything else, this is your living room, your bedroom. And that's your bathroom. This is the solution part of problem reaction solution right here. And I've seen comments from people who are obviously not from America saying that Americans like me are spoiled not to accept this. But I would say if you have not been here, then you really don't understand what's going on here in America. There's so much empty land here. You know, every time we're out here, these road trips it just reminds me of how absolutely overpopulated everything is just all these humans you can clearly see they're just like smashed in together there's no room for anyone anywhere nothing just people everywhere taking up all the resources in space and just procreating just pushing out nature there's no open space anymore it's just people everywhere it's just wall to wall floor to ceiling all right, planet your, people. Your sarcastic comment I, doesn't take into account the cramped cities they've pushed us into. You can't get cell phone signal out of here. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of overpopulated. <laughs> Just so much empty space here, okay? A. And B, this right here is very unworkable, actually. This does not offer the things that the tiny living solution is supposed to be sold as offering. If you live in Paris, in a tiny apartment in Paris, and you walk out your door, you have all kinds of ways to get around public transportation, and you are moments away from all kinds of beautiful architecture and things to go do and see, and it's... <laughs> I mean, I, I live in a state that doesn't even have sidewalks in, in some places in the town. Yay, it's a sidewalk. Oh, no more sidewalk. Let alone bike lanes or a functioning integrated public transportation system that can actually take you between major metro areas easily. Like, we don't have the kind of public transportation interconnected network system that Europe has at all. <laughs> To have a functioning public transportation system in a major city here is the exception, not the rule. It's really nothing like Europe at all on that score. It doesn't even compare to this, which is not even in a downtown metro area. I saw people saying, well, that would be a great deal if you were in San Francisco or New York City. This is not either of those places. It's not even actual San Antonio. So this neighborhood where this is here is a 30 minute walk from a Walmart. A lot of cops at Walmart. Did he just immediately turn his lights on? So your house will be right here behind the heavily secured Walmart. Cops leaving the Walmart right now. It's just a lot of cops at Walmart. And the two roads you could walk on are both 45 mile per hour trafficked roads. Like they're not safe roads that is jaunt down with all your groceries in a bag on your back, I guess, or whatever it is you're supposed to be doing in this walkable, smart, trendy city thing they're trying to do here. I don't even know. I mean, I think there's maybe a bus, one bus that runs out in this area, but. I don't know how long it would take if you were riding that and you had to get to a job in the downtown area. I'm not even sure. Probably a long while. You're a 30 minute walk from the nearest laundromat, which you're gonna have to go to because 
I mean, unless you're washing all of your laundry in your tiny sink and hanging it up in your tiny strip of grass yard, you're going to have to get in a car and drive to that laundromat because you're not carrying baskets of laundry 30 minutes so that you could go do all that and then carry it all home. I mean, I guess you could. So you're going to take buses to get there. So this is not the infrastructure that they promise with these tiny houses is not here in this place where they're building them at all. And the thing is, in this country, they really skipped a whole step with that transportation, with the way transportation is. You know, in Europe, you can buy a pass and get on a train and that pass will last you. You can go between cities and people go on trains to go between major cities in other countries all day long. That's that's happening and it's very functional and efficient and it goes all day long. We, we don't have that in many places here. If I had to guess, I'd say passenger train travel is the least utilized mode of public transportation in this country. Once cars got here, all of the investment was shifted into the highway system. Sometime after the steam engine, the trolley car made its appearance. And here again was a revolutionary impact on city life. From almost every American community, the trolley car widened the horizon and moved out into rural space. We have all but forgotten the rural trolleys with their quaint station stops. Throughout the 1920s, that was a huge focus, which was greatly accelerated under President Eisenhower with his interstate system. Detroit is borrowing funds to build more miles of expressway and build them today. And by the 50s, they were really pushing and promoting every household needs to own multiple cars. Our American dream of Futurama on wheels can come true. Freedom of the road is as old as the first man and as new as this moment. And you can tell that, that many cities have been laid out with the idea of private car ownership being the main form of transportation. And it centralized our major metropolitan areas. Mass transportation has accelerated the centralization of cities everywhere. Then they said, yeah, it's all traffic, it's congested, it's terrible, we really need to stop this now. We have become the nation on wheels, with more motorized mobility than ever dreamed of before. Though we have the greatest highway system in all the world, it can't carry the mounting traffic of our growing greatness. Uh, I think it's appropriate to call it the greatest misallocation of resources in the history of the world. You can call it a uh, technosis externality cluster <laughs> and Now we're to the point where they're saying they're going to outlaw gas car ownership, and we don't really have the infrastructure. If every single person that owns a gas car were to turn around and own an electric car, I don't think that would work. I, I don't think we have the infrastructure to support it. Not to mention, I mean, most people can't afford them anyways. Parking regulations in the city are set to dissuade people from using cars. Regulations like this back in angle parking on South Congress. Back in angle parking is a <laughs> back in angle parking is a multi-step process where you stop, turn on your turn signal, then pull forward, then carefully angle backwards into a spot, all while holding up traffic. And you have to hold the door all kinds of special, and then eek sideways into your car just to get back in. And WEF has been saying for a long time that we should get rid of private car ownership. So if they turn around and say we're not going to have private car ownership anymore in a country where they don't have other forms of infrastructure available to people like they do in Asia and Europe, then I guess what they're really saying is they just don't want people to travel. Because we don't have those things to turn to in the ways that other countries, we don't have light rail and bullet trains and all that, so we don't have that. Amtrak runs 21,400 miles of passenger track in 46 states, which means two of our contiguous states don't even have train at all. If you see a train, it's usually a freight train. That is what most of the train system is used for in this country, is for freight. It's not used for passengers. Just for an example, just to show you what I'm talking about, if I were to get on a train in Austin, Texas, and take that train to New Orleans, 
It would take me 27 hours to get from Austin, Texas to New Orleans. By comparison, if I get in my car in Austin, Texas, and I drive to New Orleans right now, it's a seven and a half hour drive. <laughs> it's not even remotely comparable. That's for if you live in a major metro area that has access to an airport. I live in central Texas in a town of 25,000 people. There's no bus system here. There's no bike lanes here. It's not the same. We have one taxi service here. It is very expensive and it closes at four o'clock on Monday. If you had to depend on that somehow, which no one does, but if you did, you better not need to go anywhere after four o'clock on a Monday. And not only that, but it's not like anybody's retiring in one of these little 350 square foot houses. Who's, or if you have any kind of health conditions at all, like back issues or anything, you're not climbing that rung ladder to get up to that little upstairs loft area. No one's grandmother is doing that. That is not happening, okay? So I don't, I don't know what this is for, really. It feels like it's that future Weff talks about where you own nothing and you're somehow happy. Although, I'm not really sure how. And if you ask them how, then they'll probably show you this article where they have psychologists that say your life doesn't even, you don't have to be happy. Your life doesn't even have to mean anything. So, <laughs> so it's really insulting when the World Economic Forum sends out tweets like this one from March 2021, where they say, thinking big by thinking small, how significantly downsizing our homes into tiny homes with all but the bare essentials is the key to building a better, more diverse, less racist society. And they gotta throw that in there because they want us to keep fighting amongst ourselves about identity politics. Meanwhile, these same people who are sending out these tweets turn around the following January and flew their private jets to the economic forum so they can lecture us all about how we don't need to own cars, how we don't need to have anything but a tiny pod. I mean, and look at this image they chose. They look like they're in a cage. Although I'm sure that's just a safety net because those stairs are absolutely deadly to that child. So I guess the child sleeps downstairs and the parents sleep right up there. There's no privacy, no door, no nothing. That's normal, that's totally normal. That's completely fine. <laughs> I mean, animals at the zoo have more space, okay? But again, we, we also know they don't want you to actually have children, so the fact that they're sending this out at all. And then again, these are the same hypocrites that turned around in January of 2022 and flew their private jets once again to Davos so they could lecture us all about how we need to live in a box and have no transportation, private transportation whatsoever. It's beyond a joke. These hypocrites are so full of shit. Personally, I don't think there's enough metaverse VR goggles in the world to make this not feel like a claustrophobic hamster cage psychology experiment plot to a straight-to-DVD B-level horror film, okay? Oh, I think I have an option you can afford it. People are calling it the coffin pot, but <laughs> it's really in your price range. And again, it isn't like they don't know this is the wrong way to make a thriving civilization full of motivated, empowered, spirited people. They do. The public realm has to inform us not only where we are geographically, but it has to inform us where we are in our culture, where we've come from, what kind of people we are, and it needs to, uh, by doing that, uh, it needs to afford us a glimpse to where we're going in order to allow us to dwell in a hopeful present. Great thinkers going back to antiquity have discussed this at length. Plotinus described the refining effect of beauty upon the unfolding consciousness of humanity in a piece called An Essay on the Beautiful. We have centuries of, of writings on this. The salient problem about this for us is that these are places that are not worth caring about. Manly P. Hall wrote about how the mysteries held that man, in, in part at least, was a product of his environment. There's not enough Prozac in the world to make people feel okay about going down this block. 
He writes, therefore, they considered it imperative that every person be surrounded by objects which would invoke the highest and noblest sentiments. This, in fact, would be a better building if we put mosaic portraits of Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, and all the other great despots of the 20th century on the side of the building, because then we'd honestly be saying what the building is really communicating to us. You, you know, that it's a despotic building. It wants us to feel like termites. They provided that it was possible to produce beauty in life by surrounding life with beauty. Thoughtful men of antiquity realized that their great philosophers were the natural products of the aesthetic ideals of architecture, music, and art established as the standards of the cultural systems of the time. Uh, these are the schools we're sending them to. The Hannibal Lecter Central School. <laughs> Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a real school. You know, but there's obviously a notion that if you let the inmates of this thing out, that they would snatch a motorist off the street and eat his liver. The substitution of the discord of the fantastic for the harmony of the beautiful constitutes one of the great tragedies of every civilization. I follow an account called Culture Critic on X, and he's always discussing you know, what happened to art and architecture and all this beauty that humanity used to create. Because anyone out there who's gazed up at one of these centuries-old cathedrals or stood before one of these sculptures knows what that feels like. It's an awe-inspiring experience, and it takes over your senses, and it's so, it's so glorious. And for that moment when you're standing there, you feel glorious too. And I guess it just feels like the peak happened a long time ago, and we're not admitting it. I've been all over this country by car. I've road tripped all contiguous 48 states and when you're on major highways if you fall asleep in the car like if Aaron's driving and I fall asleep and I wake up and I don't know which city we're next to you wouldn't be able to tell that just by looking at what's there because most of the time it's the same five fast food restaurants the same couple of hotel chains and a couple of the same gas station chains these little chunks every city along the highway. It all looks the same. There is nothing special about any of it. You could interchange one for the other just as easily, take it or leave it. And I, when I was doing those reports on obsolescence and I was looking at the way air travel used to look. Contemporary flyers consider themselves lucky if they receive a free bag of peanuts and a cup of water to wash it down. That's a far cry from the multi-course meals they served in the 60s, complete with fancy silverware and tablecloths. Even economy passengers ate and drank like royalty. Despite technically being complimentary, the food and drinks were largely why airfare was so high. As excessive as 60s air travel was, the 70s took things to new heights with the introduction of piano bars. And things like that. I mean, you can tell that we ran society in a way that was human-centered we cared about each other in a way that we just simply stopped they they treated all of that away for so-called efficiency and trying to make the most money they possibly can by shoving the most people in the smallest amount of space they can everywhere you look planes trains automobiles houses all of it there's a general uh, uh, idea in America that the, the remedy for, for mutilated urbanism is nature. I mean, we, we're to the point now where we have scientists talking about substituting trees for these rectangles of green goop in urban areas. I mean, what in the actual hell are we doing? When you degrade the public realm, you will automatically degrade the quality of your civic life and the character of all the enactments of your public life and communal life that take place there. You know, and I, I just, I guess what I don't understand is why everyone is just accepting this fate of the dystopic future hell. Is it really the consequence of there being so many dystopian films or what? It feels like everyone's just kind of accepting like, yeah, the future's gonna suck. Here comes Blade Runner, we're all just gonna walk right into it. Consequently, these will be places that nobody uh, wants to be in. Uh, these will be places that are not worth caring about. We have about you know, 38,000 places that are not worth caring about in the United States today. When we have enough of them, we're gonna have a nation that's not worth defending. And I, I'm just saying we don't have to. The future doesn't have to be a horrible nightmare. We don't have to just lay down and accept a dystopian 
future where we all live in a box so small that when we die, they probably just bury the house because it's about the same size as a coffin. That's all I'm saying. I don't know what the hell we're doing, but I don't see why we are. bear in the street, which feels even more vivarium than it did when we first pulled in here. Anyway, I love you guys. Thank you.